All right, let's get started. Hope everyone had a nice weekend. Um, Kuram Javed, a master's student at RLEI, is going to start all the talks for this week by telling us about learning causal models online. Thanks, Abhishek. Uh, so as Abhishek said, I'm going to uh, I'm a master's student with Martha, and I'm going to talk about learning causal models online. And uh, in the beginning of this year, I was visiting uh, Mila as a visiting student, and uh, this is and my goal was to um, understand the kind of work that they're doing and see if I can uh, bring those ideas to the problems that we care about or I care about. So this work is a result of that goal. And it's also in collaboration with uh, Joshua and Marta. Um, so before I dive into the ideas about the talk, I first want to give an overview of the online learning problem. Um, specifically, I'm going to give a, an architecture that I use to just think about the problem. And uh, it's something that most of you are already familiar with. Uh, so at, at time step t, the agent has a state as t, and it takes an action. And uh, after taking the action, it will get an observation from the environment, which describes the next time step. And uh, all of this will go into a function approximator that I call the representation learning network. And the output will be the state of the agent at next time step. And uh, uh, many of you would have seen this before because this is exactly the same as uh, the state update function that Rich talks about in his book. Um, so that's what I call representation learning. That's how I'm going to define it. And then the agent can use this state to predict different things. And uh, I'm going to call that a prediction learning network. Uh, and uh, so it can use that to predict a value or one step target or uh, actions or a model. And uh, my claim is that we already have decent methods. Uh, we haven't solved this problem with prediction learning, but we have decent methods for, decent online learning methods for solving this later task, that given a state representation, you can do interesting things. And, and some examples are TD learning or expectation model that G and Zahir worked on or eligibility traces or 8-bit for, uh, for optimizing the learning rate. Now, what about this representation learning part? Do we have good methods for this representation learning? And, I, um, and when I say good methods, I mean good online methods. And my claim is that we do not have any good methods for this part of the problem. And you might say, well, what about deep reinforcement learning? And the idea in deep reinforcement learning is to just learn the prediction and the representation end to end using the same target that you're using to optimize for your prediction learning network. And uh, this, and this, is, this works pretty well empirically, but uh, it doesn't scale for the online learning case. And it doesn't scale because if your observations have long-term long temporal dependencies, because again, you can't see the state of the MDP, you're working on some observation, uh, then you have to do, if you want to use back, uh, back propagation, you have to use back propagation through time, which does not scale with, uh, with respect to amount of compute and amount of memory that you need to do it. Okay, so that's, the, that's just the architecture that I use to think about online learning. And uh, I'm going to present this work within this framework. So first I'm going to, the part one of this talk is going to be about a metric for detecting what I call spurious features. Um, and in this part of the talk, I'm going to assume that I have a state. Uh, and the second part of the talk, I'm going to, uh, to, to propose a method for learning representations such that when you combine both of them, you can do it end to end. So let's first focus on the part one. Um, and first, I have to define what I mean by a spurious feature. So I'm going to give a somewhat of a formal but still informal definition. And the, the definition is that if the correlation of a feature F1 uh, with respect to a stationary target is only locally stationary, then F1 is a spurious feature. Now, what do I mean by locally stationary? I mean that uh, in, in, in some parts of the MDP, F1, imagine F1 has a positive correlation with the target. And then in other parts of the MDP, the same feature has a negative correlation or no, or no correlation with the target. And this is not some definition that I just came up uh, myself. This is inspired by this paper by Martin uh, Arjuski about invariant risk minimization. In fact, I would say this definition is 90% the same as uh, his definition with, uh, with small modification to make it so that it makes sense in the online learning case. And uh, you might say, why does this definition make sense? Well. Um, so I'm going to give some, some hand wavy explanations uh, and maybe some good reasons, we'll see. So imagine that you have a feature that has a correlation of uh, plus 0.99 with the target on some part of your stream, and the same feature has a correlation of minus 0.99 in other parts. So the feature is always strongly correlated with your target, 
It's just that the sign of the correlation switches. And my claim is that this is a bad feature. And uh, you might say, why? Because if the agent is learning online, the agent can just track the change in the correlation. And it is highly predictive of the target. So it, we can use it to minimize the credit. It would be pretty good. And that's true. But the problem with having these features, uh, especially if you, if you have no way of figuring out what the correlation is at a given state, so that's the latent part. Uh, then you, number one, you can't do model-based planning if, you, if you're, so imagine you want to do model-based planning on some distant part of the MDP, and uh, you can't use the current estimate of your weight for that feature to predict what would happen in other parts of the MDP because the correlation is changing and evolving over time. So can I ask a question just? Yep. Probably you have a short answer to that. Why, why do we care about individual features? Um, so we don't care about it so you can you can formulate most of your prediction tasks. So imagine you want to predict some part of the word. You can say that it is composed of different properties of that object, and that object is just the features, right? Can I maybe follow up and show this question? What if, mm -hmm. if what if the thing you're trying to predict is actually the exclusive or of two features? Uh, so, so that won't be the case because I have a representational learning network, right? So the representational learning network will make sure that the feature uh, that we find features such that you can linearly combine them to predict it. Sounds like a very strong assumption, but I'll listen on and see what comes next. No, right. So it is a strong assumption if you assume that you you are fixing the features, but your features will also evolve, and I will go over that in this part two of the talk. Um, and uh, the, uh, the other reason why we can't do this is we can't always adapt online um, because we might want to generalize to cases that we never want to try. An example is that uh, you might want to predict what happens if the agent jumps off a cliff. And sure, you can, you can adapt these features if you jump off the cliff, but you don't want to ever attempt it. So you want to do zero-shot generalization sometimes. Um, and it also doesn't make sense intuitively. So I'm going to give the canonical example that people in causal, causal literature will give, which is of uh, cows and camels. So if you're trying to make a classifier which can differentiate between cows and camels, and you take, you go out and you take pictures of them, um, most of the pictures of cows would have grass in the background. Most of the pictures of camels would have sand in the background. And if you train a classifier on that, then the predictor would uh, exploit the features of the background to predict what the target is. Uh, so if you, if you take a cow on sand, if you take a camel on grass, the prediction would be incorrect. And that is something that just, that's not an example. People have demonstrated that this indeed happens. Um, and uh, this is clearly not something we want because we want to use features which are which are uh, predictive of the target in all cases. So the, the, the argument that they give about unstable features is that if you take pictures of cows in different areas, let's say different countries, the correlation, or let's imagine you go to a, to a grassland with no cows, now suddenly you have grass, but it's not correlated with cows. So the correlation of grass with respect to the the animal is changing over time, whereas if you look at the features which are actually predictive of cow, like the shape of the cows, those features are stable. So that's just a hand wavy example that people in causal literature give that that stable features are good and, inst and and features which are which are not stable, whose correlation is not stable, are not good. Well, of course, the target label would be the best feature, right? Uh, right. Yes, that's true. But that's true. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, we want to do linear function approximation to predict the target with respect to the features. So it will be you, very good if you have as a feature the label. Right, that would be very nice. That would be nice, I agree. Yeah. Okay. So, and, that would be a, and that would be a stable feature, right? If that feature is always predictive of the target, it's a stable feature, so that feature is good according to my definition. Um, okay. okay. So the part one is, like I said, I want to first introduce a metric for detecting these spurious features. And uh, we have to do it online. So let's introduce some notation. I have n binary features, and I have n weights. So I'm going to linearly combine them to predict something. And uh, I want to learn this uh, function, f of w, which is parameterized by these n weights. Um, and uh, the, there's also a ground truth model that we don't have access to. And that model will give us the ground truth labels. And uh, we have a cost function which returns the prediction error. And finally, the setting is that at every time step t, the agent is going to predict the target. And then it's going to incur a loss uh, with respect to that prediction and the ground truth label. 
And after it has incurred the loss, it will get the true label from the environment, which is the standard setting that people use in online learning. And once it has this label from the environment, you can use that label to update your prediction learning network um, using whatever method you want. I'm just going to use the gradients to, to train the last linear predictor. Okay, so let me give you a very concrete example uh, in which I'm going to do experiments. So my state space has 12 features and uh, the targets are binary and the first five feet and the first 10 features are mutually exclusive. So only one of them is one and the everything else is zero. And uh, uh, if any of the first five feature is one, that means that there's a 75% probability the target is zero. And if any of the last uh, next five features are one, uh, then there's a probability that the target is one. And this 11th feature predicts that the target is one with either 80% probability, 90% probability, or 10% probability. And uh, um, at any given point, what is this the, the, the exact uh, dependence of this 11th feature on the target is not known to the agent. It can infer it online, but it's not something that is available to the agent. So essentially what I'm saying is the expected value of the target with respect to the 11th feature can be 0 0.8, 0 0.9, or 0.1. Um, at, and every time step, there is a one in a thousand probability that the the, prob the expected value of the target with respect to 11 feature will go from 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 or vice versa. And that's where the agent will learn. And then we will evaluate the agent when this expected value is 0.1. And when we are evaluating it, the agent will not be doing online learning. And again, the idea is that you can you can look at this evaluation as either zero shot the the measure to see if the agent is doing zero shot generalization or when you're planning, you can't go and adapt the weight online. So you can maybe, or maybe you're planning in this unseen part of the MDP where the expected value is 0.1. Um, and uh, coming up with an online method to detect these features is not that hard. The key idea is that uh, we're going to measure the variance of the weights associated with the features and we can do this online. So we can, we can compute an online estimate of the mean of the weights associated with all the features. Um, because as the agent is tracking, the weights would be changing. And then using this mean, we can compute the variance online. And uh, there already is a method for that, which is called Welford's method. Uh, but I am going to modif modify it slightly so that it, it computes an exponentially decayed estimate instead of computing the variance of the, uh, from, from zero time step. Okay. Um, so why would this work? This would work because the weight associated with the feature that is not stable that will change over time when we're doing online tracking because you can't convert for that weight. And uh, because it would change over time, we would expect that weight to have higher variance when tracking. So does it work? Um, yes, there are, there are some very small things that you have to make sure happens to make it work. But for example, you have to be sure that um, there is an optimal, that, that the other features can converge, which would happen if you have some kind of regularization on your base. But if this doesn't make sense, it's not that important. You can forget about it. Uh, and I have to compare it to some methods. So I'm going to compare it to this Oracle IRM. And IRM is, again, the method which was used in the, the paper by Martin. Uh, and I'm calling it Oracle because it requires this information that is not available to the online agent. So the Oracle IRM requires batches conditioned on the latent variable. And again, the latent variable is what is the correlation of the eleven feature with respect to the target? It's 0 0.8, 0 0.9, or 0 0.1. And to optimize the IRM objective, you need two different uh, batches of data. And in those two batches, the, the, the expected value, the latent vari variable needs to have different values. And this is the information that our online agent does not have access to. Uh, so if you use Oracle IRM, and I'm, the, the objective is uh, not, maybe not that important to the talk, so I skipped it, but you can consult the original paper, which is a very well written paper. Uh, so if you use the Oracle IRM gradient, this is what you get, right? It, it's, the gradient is telling you, and I'm showing the gradient for the, the regularization penalty for computing, for detecting spurious features. It's telling you that the last two features are spurious, where the first 10 are not spurious. Uh, and that's what we would expect. Uh, and this is the online variance estimate. Uh, the online variance estimate agrees with the gradient of the Oracle IRM very well. And it doesn't have, like, the, these are not computing the exact same thing, but they are essentially capturing the same information. Uh, now I want to remind that when the agent is continually learning online using the latest sample, so ST at time step T, and you can ask a question, well, what happens if you're tracking using a large experience replay buffer? And then you compute the same variance estimate. And uh, it's 
fairly intuitive that in that case it would not work. And the reason it would not work is when you sample IID from an experienced C-play buffer, you lose the temporal information that you need to track to figure out what's the variance of the weight. So experienced C-play essentially gets rid of this information which is important for detecting spurious features as I define them. Okay, so I'm going to show some results. Uh, the first is online learning. I'm using Atom with, uh, after optimizing all the parameters. And uh, the CMDP part is where the agent is learning. And here the correlation of the 11 feature with the target is either 0.8 or 0.9. And the unseen MDP is where the correlation is 0.1 and the agent is not agent does not get to learn on this part. Uh, and on the CMDP, the online learning method does very well because it's a very simple problem. And on the unseen MDP, it doesn't do well because it's essentially using these spurious features to predict the target. Oracle IRM can learn to ignore the spurious features so it gets, it, it achieves 75% accuracy um, on this binary classification task on scene and on scene MD MDP, which is the best you can do uh, because we uh, the good features have uh, have a predictive power of 75%. And the online online IRM, so now I'm, I have an online version of the same IRM paper, uh, sorry, IRM method, that also doesn't work well because it really needs those samples conditioned on the expected value of the latent variable, uh, conditioned on the latent variable. And then the methods that, that I use um, propose uh, also works well and can ignore these spurious features. Not surprising because you can just see in this graph that it can detect those features. But, but this was part one. This was like we have features, some of them are good, some of them are spurious, and we can get rid of the bad ones. Okay, not that surprising and fairly simple idea. Uh, but the, the real problem really is that how do you find these features? So uh, I'm going to propose a representation search method for, Im for improving these features, and this is very similar to generate and test. Um, so first I'm going to explain what the experimental setting is. I'm going to take the same state and instead of operating on the state space, I'm going to operate on this image which encodes the same information. So how is that the case? The digit in the image correspond to which of the featured in the first 10 features is activated. So zero means the first feature would be activated. One means the second would be activated. And uh, the color encodes what is the uh, the down feature, right? So if the color is green, then there is a 80, 90, and 10% probability that the target is one. Uh, and if the color is red, then vice versa. And now the agent does not have access to this nice state space. Now the agent has to operate on these images. And they're still Markovian, like the image is encoding the same information, but the method that I propose uh, would work in a non-Markovian case as I see it. Okay, so what is this representation search method? I'm calling it perturbation with backtracking. And the idea is that, well, there are four steps. And the first step is to estimate metric of choice. So here I care about the variance estimate because that tells me how spurious the features are. But you could optimize for, you could, you could estimate your regret, you could uh, uh, estimate your online loss or any other metric that you can compute online. The second step is that you're going to create a perturbation in the parametric space of the representational learning network. So you're going to go and change some ways in your representation learning network. And you can do this in hundreds of different ways. And I, I just do it very naively using, uh, by randomly picking some weights and either turning them one, minus one, or zero. Um, and you can also do something better than random, but so far for this work, I'm just doing random. Now after the perturbation, you can re-estimate the metric uh, the same metric, and then you can check if the the re-estimated metric is better, or if it's worse, uh, or if it's the same. And if it's better, you can keep the perturbation, and if it's worse, then you can revert back to the old state of the representational learning network. And that's why it's called perturbation with backtracking, because you only want to change something if it improves features. If it doesn't improve features, then you don't want to do that. Um, okay, and you can look at this method as a, a random local search because I'm not really changing the whole representation learning network randomly. I'm changing some small part of it. So the, the resulting network is, uh, the change is very local and it's very small. Um, and the idea is that if you just do it enough times, you will discover good features. And you just repeat it um, forever or until your agent dies, I guess. Um, so what are the metrics that I care about in my in my work? Well, I care about two metrics. One is I want to reduce the sum of the variance of the weights because as I explained, this captures how spurious the features are with respect to the target. And But that's not the only goal because if I just optimize for this, the, the model can just output 
zero features and they would have zero variance, but those are terrible features. We also want to reduce the running loss, uh, the online loss of the target. So we want to maximize the performance, minimize the variance. Uh, so now I'm going to show results on this image version of the same task. And these results have some caveats that I'm not going to go over because uh, it, it will take some time. Um, they're not alarming. You can read the paper, and I think it's fine to skip them. Um, but these are the results. So the first two are Oracle IRM, which has a, a lot of parameters. So I'm, uh, I'm, used, I'm out showing results for two different versions because uh, I really wanted to optimize IRM as good, well as possible. Um, and it works, and it can ignore the color information and, and detect uh, that uh, and learn to predict and do well on the unseen NDP. And then the perturbation with backtracking all does uh, equally well, and it doesn't have any parameters. You can just run it. It will take much longer because it is a random search, but you don't have to optimize for parameters, and it is also online, whereas the Oracle one is not online. Um, so what are the conclusions of this? Uh, am I saying that we should only use non-spurious features for predicting? Not really. Um, if you have a feature which is highly predictable or target and you can track the chain, it's mostly fine to use that feature. Um, but if you don't have access to the complete MDP or if you care about strong generalization for planning on unseen part of the MDP or if you care about zero-shot generalization, then you really don't want features which are very unstable. So I'm not saying we should not use them at all, but we should probably not use them if some features are very unstable. And uh, the other question is, well, what about causality? The title of the talk is Learning Causal Model Online, I, and I did not mention the word causality even once in the whole presentation. And uh, that's because, um, so I have thought about this a lot, and what my conclusion is that instead of trying to find the right, the correct causal explanation directly, and this is something that people do by making causal graphs, causing interventions, and doing a lot of work, and all those methods are great, but they're not compatible with online learning, what we can instead do is we can just continually get rid of the wrong explanation. And when I say wrong explanation, I mean don't rely on any spurious features. And just hope that whatever is left is more likely to be the causal explanation than the explanation that relies on those spurious features. And I think it's not very dissimilar to how, the, how we discover causal explanations about the words in the scientific method. Like we have no mechanism for directly going out and figuring out the right causal structure of the word. We come up with hypotheses, we test them, we reject the bad one, we improve it, and then we just repeat the process and hope that whatever is left is the causal explanation. But we have no guarantees that that is the case. And finally, isn't random perturbation a terribly slow way of learning representations? Well, yes, it definitely is, but my claim is that it's better than learning by optimizing for the wrong thing. And uh, in a lot of uh, online uh, learning work in which you're trying to learn from sensory data, people try to opt to, people, you can't compute the right gradient because that's not scalable. So they, they approximate the gradient or they have proxy objectives to optimize for. And uh, those are not the right thing. So it's, it's better to have a slow process that improves the representation over time instead of having a biased process, which might just find terrible representation and, and converge. And uh, I'm still sure that almost everyone is not convinced that this is a good idea, this random perturbation. So if you, uh, if you want to be convinced, you should come to my thesis defense, which is on 14 September, in which I will talk about this idea in more detail with more experiments for about an hour. Um, so that's pretty much it. If you are interested in the paper, you can read it. It's an archive. and. Uh, yeah, if you have questions, I would be happy to answer them. Question from a child's playset, if that's okay. Yep. Um, so it's mainly following up on Chaba and Russ's comments from earlier on, but uh, uh, does the spurious feature idea rule out, say, stable oscillating patterns of features? So if you had, say, stimulus in the, in the environment that sort of that inversely vary to covaried. Does the spurious feature idea sort of rule out that you might be able to see those oscillating populations and, and build good build good expectations based on them? Um, so I'm not sure if I completely understand the question. Um, if your target is stationary, uh, if, if you have a feature for which you really have to change the weight in different parts of the, of the MDP in an online way, then yes, it will get rid of it because it will have high variance when you're tracking. But my claim is that if your target is stationary, you should not have a feature like that. Uh, and, and those features are important when your target is not stationary, it's changing in some way.
maybe I can try to rephrase this question uh, to be a bit more constructive. Uh, maybe the question is like whenever we make some uh, some uh, restriction on uh, or preferences, like we are expressing preferences here, like what features would make sense. The question that is natural to ask is whether you unduly uh, restrict the representations that you can learn this way. Uh, so have you thought about this question? Right. Um, I have thought about it. And that's one of the reasons why I said we, uh, I don't think we should not rely on these features at all. Right? I, I said that if you, if you just care about your online performance, then it's fine to rely on them. Right? But if you, if you care about methods that can do zero-shot generalization, like, for example, you want to build rovers on Earth that will operate on Mars without ever going there. Uh, that's, the, that's the kind of work in which I think you need to be sure that you rely on stable features. Because you can't afford to adapt those features online. So you might as well not rely on those features at all. I don't quite see how you can jump. So, so what, in a way, uh, I find it surprising. So, so for you, okay, question form. For you, a feature means uh, something that takes a, a single real value. That's it. That's a feature. Uh, could it be a vector or like no? What? So, so it, it's it's a single value in in this. When I say right. feature, I mean a single. In fact, it's like I use binary features. We can probably what, use real value. Yeah. What's but. the significance of having a single real number? So why can't we just have you know like some features that help each other and then you know? Oh, like, you can. All together, they're able to uh, to come up with a good, stable way of predicting the target, but individually each of them look unstable for you. So in a way, you, you are imposing the restriction of linear prediction on the top of things, which is okay, maybe, if you can also argue in a forceful way that that's not a restriction. Uh, but together with this one dimensional thing that like the features individually have to be real numbers and then maybe if you add some smoothness to that then it will appear to me that this could be a restriction that uh, sometimes is going to be in a way of uh, achieving good performance so 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 what's the so what i'm saying is i'm not really saying the features are independent from each other the feature no, is, no, yeah, the, yeah. Set of, the set of features is a vector, right? Yeah, so but, I'm not sure what you mean when you say, why can't it be a vector? Because it can be a set of features is the vector. So you have multiple well, features. Said, and, like I was asking you about whether you're happy with the definition yeah. that the feature is a single right. vector. I, right. I was trying to be careful there because I wasn't sure about that. Uh, so I thought that like if you know hmm. a little bit of uh, leeway there, then you can... Uh, maybe uh, increase the representation power of this this whole thing quite a bit. Uh, I'm not entirely sure by how much. So what do you mean by increase it? Uh, by that I mean like the, the range of environments that you can deal with. Uh, like what sort of conditions, uh, under what sort of conditions, if you reverse engineer like for what sort of like problems you can hope to get good performance uh, uh, with this proposed definition, it's going to give you some answer. And if I have some other definition, maybe I get a bigger set, then I can say that I increase the scope of my method. And so that, that's what the sense that I was using. Right. Um, so like I, I'm still not sure why how this is not as general as possible because all I'm saying is you have a representation learning part and all the complexity of the environment goes in the representation learning part. And then you have the good old linear function approximation in the last layer, something that people in RL I do see. all the time anyway, right? So it's, it's the same, same. I uh, see. You can again. push the difficulty into the representation right. learning part, so right. to say. Although... Yeah, so a related question to that is that I found it quite strange that you call the state update function the representation learning part. Uh, it's a bit weird. I would have ex expected that somehow, like, you, okay, so that maintains the representation, but it seems that there is no feedback from outside observations to update this representation or, or was there? 
Um, so, so the feedback yeah, is from your metric that you care about, right? So if you care about regret, then the feedback for updating the representation is coming from your estimate of the regret, the online estimate of the regret. But it, that's it the only that feedback. you're expecting an open loop uh, state update function to be able to work well in environments. So if you add a little noise to any environment, then that won't happen, right? So if, if, if there is a real MDP with a few states, there are random transitions, then you need that feedback from the observations so that you can adjust your beliefs about what did actually happen. Um, anyways, um, yeah, I, I guess this is unrelated to the previous things and just trying to cover more ground. Chad, are you saying that RNNs don't make sense when you're going to have stochastic transitions? I'm saying that the RNN would need to take some input because we need a filtering component that takes in new observations to adjust the predictions of the states. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But I think so I, the observations going in. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I didn't see that. I wasn't sure whether it's there or not. But for representation learning, pers like, yeah, like, it just like, you learn to represent, like, whatever your belief is about the word and that needs some input from the word. <laughs> right. right. So, but it, it did have input from the world, right? It did, right. Yeah, it did. Uh, I mean, this, this seems to be an open loop thing. Uh, like you can just... Observation is part of the input. Right. So, so this, this observation, that's the... Oh, that is an observation. All right. All right. Okay. Then right, then, right, right. Okay. Yeah. So that, that, all right, so that, that's how it is. Okay, it's doing and, then, and, okay. and the reason I call it representational learning network and not just state update function, which would make more sense, is because I noticed the that they are the exact same thing after I finished the write up of this paper, and then uh, so yeah, I will probably change it to that later. Oh, okay. So Kuram, uh, to clarify, what do you mean by features? So they are the uh, nodes from the neck of the network that are supposed to be. Uh, combined linearly to produce the output. Is that correct? Right. Uh, that's one way of looking at it. The, the, yeah, sure. There, there would be some real number or some vector that the network would output. Now, it doesn't have to be a feed-forward network at this point because we don't really need the gradients to update it. So it, you can have a weird network as well if you want. But in, in either case, like uh, you're considering the neck of the, the nodes from the neck of the, you know, the neck, like after which you have just the linear layer, to produce the output, we um, often call that the neck. <laughs> so so it, the, the last, yeah, it, the last layer. It, it doesn't have to be that because, uh, so the way that I work is my network can decide to use an observation pixel as a feature as well if it wants. Like all you have to do is make sure that that solution exists in your model class. And because you don't need gradients in this case, you can really define very arbitrary representation learning networks and all that works out because you're Okay, so let, let me be more specific. When you are looking for spurious uh, features, mm -hmm. are you only considering the features that are at the last layer or all the inner nodes they are subject to be removed? Right, so, so I'm only considering the features that the prediction learning network is using to predict the target. And uh, that's it. Anything that is in that is it's not using, so inner nodes, those are not being used. Because so you don't care about the stability of those nodes? Uh, I, I, so stability of those doesn't really make sense because I'm only updating the prediction learning network online, right? The rest of the network is fixed when I'm doing online adaptation. So those features are by definition always stable. Uh, so how do you learn? Like they're generated randomly once and that's it? No, you so, you just just, randomly you, yeah. so you just randomly perturb some part of the representation learning network. You see if it improves the metric or if it if the metric gets worse. If it improves it, you will keep the random perturbation and you just keep on doing it forever. Like the, you never stop learning, updating the representation. I see, so you never use backprop to update those? I never use backprop because back you can't use backprop. Uh, so the reason I don't use backprop is because if you look at the variance estimate, uh, the online estimate of the variance, you it, it takes many steps to compute it uh, reasonably accurately. It might take one million uh, steps. So then right. you have to use backpropagation through time through those one million steps, which doesn't work online. Right. But how about the restriction that you imposed on yourself about the linear combination? How about like uh, your producing actions? It's a, it's a other parameters um, of the policy distribution. Would that work? So, so there, there is an assumption that 
be we can learn state representation such that linear is all you need. But that being said, uh, the prediction learning network I don't think has to be uh, linear. I think linear is good enough. I don't see why the representation learning network cannot just do all the heavy lifting. Uh, but you're right. Like my the method I propose wouldn't make sense if the prediction learning network is nonlinear. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Can I ask one question? Um, I mm -hmm. suppose lots of people here have never really thought about what it means to have causal features, which is sort of what you're talking about. And then the example you gave where there's like this bit that has 80% and the 90% and 10% correlation is, is pretty um, not grounded in any kind of real example. Do you have any examples where you might actually see this happen? Like you have some feature that's highly um, correlated and then later on you, it's not? So the example I'm going to give is from this IRM paper. Um, and the example they use is, again, it's the same cow example, right? You take pictures of cows in their natural habitat, and the grass is highly correlated with cows. And then you suddenly take cows on some desert, and suddenly you should want to predict it's a cow. Uh, and if you were relying on those features, which is the background grass, uh, that's not a stable, uh, that's not something you want to do. So that's a non-causal feature for predicting that the image has a cow in it. Um, and... Uh, isn't so there that's, a tricky part there, by the way? Sorry? But that is a very tricky part of the question, right? Because the grass could be causal too, and, and the scent could also be causal. Like It only depends on whether it ever happens that you have the opposite condition, right? If that never happens, then it's totally fine. Right, to, right. To so, so, so that's why I don't define non the Features that are not spurious, according to my definition, are not causal. I don't ever say that. They can also be spurious. It's just that you have never seen that part of the MDP where you have to go to figure out that they're not causal. Um, but, but that being said, I think there are features that you, uh, there are, so let me give you a more, maybe a more grounded example, which is what, uh, which is also from that paper. And, and that, they say that if you, if you see images of cows in different countries, just because different countries are different, the background will have statistical differences, uh, whereas uh, even if there are features which are always predictive, like grass, uh, but the true causal feature would stay stable no matter where you go. Uh, so you don't really have to say that the, the cow has to go to a desert. You can just say that maybe some countries less green and suddenly you have this discrepancy and then you can pick that up. What about the other direction? Are there examples where there's features that their correlation changes a lot, but they actually, um, you know, are, should still be useful features to use? Like, what um, do you think? I think Chabra brought this up earlier, but like, what is being lost by putting in this pretty strong view? So, so I think there are uh, even non-causal features that can be highly predictive of a target, and uh, it, it makes sense to use them. And so the example. That, uh, that, that's an experiment that I did on myself just to see if I could do it on people in the audience. And it, it, did. it, was, it was not easy to do it. But the idea is that you, you're reading this uh, text which has colors written on it, so green, blue, red, and the color of the text uh, is also the same as the actual word. And then halfway through, the color of the text changes, and now, the, now you really have to read the text to, to understand what you're saying. So what I mean is you would have green, blue, red, and the green would be written in green, blue would be written in blue, red would be written in red, and after some time, uh, green might be written in some other color. And if you want to read that as fast as possible, uh, I at least cannot pick when it changes. I start reading the color because it's just easier to pick the color. And uh, I would keep on reading the color and then I would realize, oh, it changed. I didn't realize when it changed. So it, it seems to me that it, it's fine to use them for predicting if you can get performance gains. Um, but maybe we still want to be somewhat, somewhat stable. And again, trade-off is uh, non spurious features can be highly predictive and they can be good. Hmm. Actually, isn't XOR just an example of this, right? Like one feature is going to be predictive of the, if, if the other feature is off, then that one feature is always predictive of the correct label and vice versa for the other feature. Um, right. But if they're right. both on together, then they're reversed, right? Right. Yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, That's so why then, I'm interesting on a two uh, example. I'm like, you, you can probably flatten this out by taking uh, an expansion of the two bits. Right. 
and get a linear predictor that solves this problem in a higher dimensional space, but the price is that you have to blow up the, the representation. Well, I think maybe that's, that's a good point for, for uh, based on this example that, although at the end of the day, okay, if, if you want, you can push everything to the representation learning network. You can say, right. oh, I thought I did pick the, the label, which is, so, uh, yeah. It, it's very limiting, but the reason I'm now coming to terms with it is because because the, the paper that I did last year, I had a nonlinear prediction network, and I was very strong about it. That no, it has to be nonlinear. Um, but if you if you want to do robust online learning, uh, I just I, having a it's just not. I, I I haven't found any good methods for learning nonlinear networks online in a scalable way. And maybe there is a method out there. So maybe I'm just taking the easy way out. But my intuition is that it's. Just, uh, not the right way to go because it, you have this catastrophic looking problem. The difficulty all, all the way to the representation learning part. Sorry? So you're pushing uh, the difficulty to the representation learning part, and at the same time, you're proposing an, an extremely generic but also very weak way of uh, learning right. this work, uh, which is okay, but are we going to get performance in the cases when we care? Um, so that's what I said that I don't expect people yeah. to be convinced by that now. So 14 September, but, um, intuitively what I, what I've seen so far empirically on some reasonably hard problem, it works much better than I would have expected. Even if you use very naive random perturbations. And I know that you don't get convinced by empirical results that much. And, uh, no, I, so, I that you're asking uh, um, so, but my, my intuition is that if, even if it's very slow, as long as the it, it fits this nice property that I want to have, that the agent should always be tracking online and the representation should always, if it improves slowly, I'm fine with that, as long as it's improving in the right direction. And so far, all the other existing methods that we have for this deep RL, they, uh, they don't work online because they, you, you can't even guarantee if, the, if you're taking a step in the right direction. Uh, so, if, so a test is if I, if you take perfect representation, so you can have a linear predictor which will give you the optimal results, and then you use these deep RL methods on that perfect representation, and you learn it online, the deep RL algorithm will, will override that perfect representation very quickly because it's using this local gradient signal. And that's a, that's a red flag to me, that if your algorithm cannot even retain optimal representations, how can it learn it? Uh, hey, Krim. I have a question about the weights. Um, are these restricted to zero, positive, negative one, or is that, um, is that the case? Or? So, so the the weights, the results in this paper, the all the weights in the representation learning are plus one, zero, or minus one, and that mm -hmm. was because you know I don't know I just uh, I guess I wanted some. Uh, so because I didn't need, need, need gradients, I didn't need gradients, I wanted to exploit that property to do something because you can have suddenly yeah. plus minus one. But now I have done experiments with uh, weights which are flowing points and uh, that works equally well. Like it, being binary is not that important. So in that case, uh, I'm curious, how would you um, perturb the weights? Is it still the same procedure or? So the way I do now is, uh, you have some probability of pruning some weights, you have some probability of increasing the weights by some small number, random number, and then some probability of reducing some random detected weights by a small number. Um, I see, but that number has to be small enough, right? Or just um, hyper So the number, the number is also random. So the number it can be from zero to 0 0.5 randomly sampled, uniformly sampled. Um, I see, but um, then how would it, Converge to a so I suppose uh, around the optimal weight, you would want that number to be uh, as small as possible, right? Or how uh, would it so converge? It, to it, the it, it, it 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 can be small, right? Because it can be from zero to point five, but I'm sampling uniformly. So uniform sampling mean it, it can be point zero 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 one if it wants to, right? Uh, it the, the right, probability then, is very small. It will it will happen after maybe one thousand years, 
but it will happen eventually. Yeah. So yeah, like I was wondering. Suppose you are almost at the correct, um, the optimal weight, and then there comes another perturb, um, and that suddenly kind of make it worse. Like how right. do you? So, um, so, the, so, yeah. so that's why I have the backtracking part, and that is that is very important to get good empirical results, and it also makes sense, right? Because if you're randomly changing things, you will break things more often than you will fix things. So you really need right. to to be able to go back to, to the old setting if it doesn't work, and that's what oh, generate see. and test uh, does does not do. It doesn't go back if it if the new random feature is even worse. Right, right. I forgot that part. Thanks. Yep. Worries. Um, so when you classically think about backtracking, like uh, people study it in like you know the uh, introductory AI courses. So what um, so what you generally do is you know let's say you're trying to solve Sudoku or something, right? So you try some solution. Like start off in one part of the state space, keep increasing it. You make some mistake, you roll back, backtrack for a while, and start again. And so, in some cases, you have to backtrack, you know, not just once, but like multiple levels because you're just right. down the wrong path of the tree, right? Um, right? So, so I'm just wondering if uh, does rolling back only one step? Um, uh, is that enough, or in this case, right. because maybe there's no tree structure as such, or so uh, any thoughts about that's, that? I think that's a really good que a good question. And the assumption that I'm making, and there is an assumption I'm making because of which I can I'm fine with make, going back one step, is that local improvements are always good. And this is not true, right? You can get stuck in a local optima, and then you might have to roll back multiple time steps to get out of the local optima. But what people have found in in deep learning literature is that if you have highly overparameterized network. Local optima seems don't really seem to be a problem, and I'm just going by that. Uh, so yes, you can get stuck in local optima with this perturbation with backtracking method. Okay. And if you backtrack more, that would not happen. But uh, that would be. But then you have to store multiple states of your network, so it, it doesn't scale well online. Yeah. So yeah, I think I think it, I agree with you that it might make sense when things are over parameterized and. Um, a local solution might be equally okay, reasonably good as a some global solution that you may never find. Right. Cool. Thanks. Uh, I have sort of a technical question. Can you tell what sort of nonlinearities you're using here? Uh, so I think I used I just binarized the features at every layer. So no, they're, like, gr they're greater than zero at every layer. So in, in oh, the whole represent. Oh wait. Uh, because uh, suddenly we can afford to be biologically plausible, and I don't think that's imp that important. But if we can, why not? Um, so right, yeah, right. So they're like LTUs with the zero threshold, right? Uh, I don't know what how LTU would work, but it's basically if the ve if the value is greater than zero, it's one. If it's less than zero, it's zero, and that's it. So yeah, zero yeah, okay. or one. Yeah, LTUs have a different threshold instead of zero. Uh, and, and like, how deep is the representation learning network? Um, so in in this work, I think there are six layers, two convolution, three fully connected. Um, but I've also <laughs> tried some absurdly large networks, which I can afford to do because I don't have to compute gradients suddenly. So I could, mm -hmm. when I say absurdly large, I mean a billion parameters, uh, and and you can do billion parameters on a GPU because uh, you have to compute gradients, but you can if you're using this, and uh, even they work fine. You can definitely overfit if you use them, but uh, but you can train right. it. Right, right. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, regarding the non-linearity, um, so, so I've been thinking whether, you know, are linear predictors all we need, right? Um, and the first thing that comes to mind is what if you had to predict something. So in this prediction learning network, what if you have to predict something which was uh, bounded, right? Let's say a probability, uh, zero, one. And uh, so in that case, you would need some sort of squashing um, mm -hmm. at the end. Uh, but uh, yeah, so um, how do we get over that? Um, so I think I, uh, in some of the experiments I did use squashing, even in this case, like a sigmoid. But uh, as long as as long as you can learn whatever prediction learning network you have, 
as long as you can estimate your metric online uh, with the squashing, which you can do for some nonlinear final function, uh, that's 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 fine, right? That's good enough. So it doesn't have to predict just a linear combination. Uh, you can replace the prediction learning network with any method that can learn online. Right. Right. I just think the nonlinearity permits that. Right, and and, and even if you have nonlinearity, like you don't have a catastrophic forgetting problem if you are if you have a sigmoid after the prediction, right? You can still learn that online. Uh, so really, I, I have a linear prediction learning network and not a multi-layer neural network, mainly to get rid of the catastrophic forgetting problem because I'm computing variance and other metrics online, and then they don't work well if you have that problem. Hey, uh, I guess I also have a question. Uh, going back to the very first example you gave with the uh, uh, binary features. Um, so I guess like this per prediction learning network, uh, this method, it uh, sort of requires that the target is stationary, that there's stationary stationarity in the MDT. And I guess I'm having a little bit of trouble understanding what you're trying to prove with that first example, because in that first example, like there's a clear non-stationarity. You switch from point eight to point nine, and then I'm testing yeah. you to point one. And I sort of understand that you're trying to highlight the fact that oh, there's uh, if I understand correctly, it goes from point eight to point nine. So the system should learn that that feature that went from point eight to point nine is not stable and shouldn't be trusted. But like. Right within your training, you've already added in now your test case is a non-stationary environment. Right, so, and, yeah. So first I will uh, just clarify that the, the, the idea of prediction learning network is fine with non-stationary, just the variance estimate does not uh, make sense in that case, right? So in general, if you're minimizing regret, then the targets can be non-stationary and that's fine. Now coming to the variance estimate, uh, the, the the change that goes from point 0.8 to point 0.9 and then point 0.1 is the way I see it is a latent variable that the agent cannot observe. And sure, to the agent, that seems like a non-stationarity uh, because the latent variable is changing. But the reason you have to assume that it's a latent variable that's changing and not any, that the non-stationarity is because of some latent variable is because otherwise the, uh, the perspective from causality doesn't make sense in that case. Because if your target is has completely changed, then sure, your features the, the value of different features can also change. So the, the perspective that stable features are better for causal explanation, that explanation only makes sense in the uh, stationary target case. But everything else, if you want to do something else, then you can have non-stationary targets, and that would work fine. Um, yeah. Not sure if that's clear. I'll read the paper. Maybe I'll message you on Slack after, but it was interesting. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Sounds good. All right. Let's keep the rest of the questions for his defense on September 14th. Uh, sounds good. All right. Thank you so right. much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah. Thanks for all the feedback and questions. Uh,